Look, I want to join you in welcoming everyone to CAR 2022. I remember my first CAR conference was 15 years ago. I was a doctoral student and it was my first time presenting at any conference, being surrounded by community members and advocates, clinicians and researchers and persons embodying several of these roles is inspiring, informative and helps to build a community of people in Canada focused on health, equity, rights and well-being in the context of HIV. Needless to say, CAR has made a huge impact helping me feel connected to the larger community of HIV researchers in Canada. And today I'm grateful to be a co-chair and to welcome you alongside Dr. Eric Arts. And now it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Moni, Mona Lutfi for the Mark Weinberg Lecture. She is an infectious disease specialist, clinician scientist, and full professor at Women's College Hospital and the University of Toronto with expertise in women and HIV and reproductive health and HIV. Her main practice is in Toronto at the Maple Leaf Medical Clinic, where she specializes in caring for women, couples, youth, and street-involved people living with HIV. She also does clinics in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and she founded the Women in HIV Research Program in 2006 and uses community-based research, working in partnership with women living with HIV to address issues most important to them. In addition to these accomplishments, she is an astounding mentor my own HIV research career began working with Mona and Wangari Thoreau with the Women's Community-Based Research Project in 2006 at Women's Health and Women's Hands Community Health Center. Not only has Mona mentored me, but multiple generations of scholars, clinicians, and activists, even winning a mentorship award. She actively gives opportunities to emerging scholars and supports career development wherever your trajectory is. If I want to celebrate any accomplishment or award or new adventure, Mona is among the first persons I will call. She is committed to learning and growing, to lifting people up within and through her work that aims to spark social change, and she is a global leader on women-centered HIV care. Mona is incredibly optimistic, believing that research can and does make a difference, and she is practical, wanting to ensure that research, that the research she does translates into better care better lives and better quality of life and equity for women and people living with HIV. It is my great honor to introduce this outstanding researcher, doctor, advocate, and personal friend. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement of where the conference is being held this year, London, Ontario. I'm very excited because London, Ontario is actually where I was born. My parents immigrated from Cairo, Egypt, as young, eager students to attend Western University. So I identify as a settler, and I acknowledge my settler privilege, which at a min minimum is the education my parents and I received at Western. London, Ontario is the traditional territory of the Anawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapawak peoples, who have long-standing connections to the land and water of the region. The land is covered by the London Township Treaty Number no. 6, which is a part of the Upper Canada Treaties. My, in my talk and for my talk, I honour the local Indigenous community-based organisations, and here is one of them at LOSA, Family Healing Services, who is dedicated to strengthening communities through Indigenous-led programs. Such community organisations are essential, and with my Indigenous colleagues, I stand in solidarity and allyship to make the truth and reconciliation uh, a, um, a reality. Here is my disclosure slide. Here is how I aim to mitigate bias in my talk. Okay, like Eric did, I have to start with an homage to Dr. Mark Weinberg, my colleague, my mentor, and my friend. Mark was a hero to me. He was a social justice warrior. Like Eric, I learned so much from Mark and I always had so much fun with him. I miss him. And I wish he was here today to listen to my talk. I hope my talk does his legacy justice. And Mark, I promise to continue your social justice passion. I dedicate my talk to my colleagues, to all my women colleagues. We did it. 
I am up here giving the most prestigious HIV lecture in Canada because of all the hard work we did together. You all know who you are. And I feel like it is all of us together standing up here talking. I thank you. And also to the many amazing men that I worked with over the years. And again, you know who you are. You're represented by this little blue cloud in the corner. But I really thank you. And it's been great working all together. I also dedicate my talk and I thank the community deeply to the women living with HIV that I've worked with and learned from. Thank you to the community leaders, research participants, community researchers and consultants, and thank you to my patients. You embraced me, encouraged me, supported me, challenged me, and you've taught me all so much. Thank you. This is depicted in this beautiful diagram of the Community at Heart framework, which was created by Claudette Cardinal and Niloufar Aran. This framework shows that community really is at the heart of our work. This framework highlights the importance of building relations, reciprocal teaching, respect, and community leadership. Thank you, Claudette and Milou, for this, this work. Okay, finally, my objectives. When I embarked to develop this presentation, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, what, what am I going to talk about? And I realized that there are hundreds of women HIV researchers in Canada. And I really felt I wanted and I, I needed to honor them. So I will review the history of these women HIV researchers in Canada. I will also present the issues that remain most important to women living with HIV in Canada. And I will end by hoping to call you all in as allies to address gender-based and other inequities experienced by women and girls affected by HIV in Canada. Let's see how I do. Okay, objective one, reviewing the history of women HIV researchers in Canada. Where do I start? I thought to myself, maybe I could make some kind of timeline. Well, how was I gonna do that? Well, I decided to design the making of my timeline and this objective like a research study. I am a researcher after all. So I came up with research questions. Who were the original women researchers in Canada? What were their stories? What, are, what were their experiences? I interviewed 55 women HIV researchers who live in Canada. Each interview was 20 to 60 minutes each. If I didn't get you in for an interview like you, Carmen, I can still do the interview. I'm going to probably write a book about it. I defined a, a woman as being anyone who, who identifies as a woman, as a trans woman, or as a gender non-binary individual with feminine identity. I interviewed 43 academic researchers and 12 community uh, researchers or knowledge users, and uh, them being all women living with HIV. I asked each one of them four questions. What has it been like? Have you had any challenges? What advice would you give to a junior woman HIV researcher and anything else? Here you go. Here is uh, my timeline of the original women HIV researchers in Canada, which I defined as uh, researchers before the year 2000, or as my children would call them, the OGs. And uh, I apologize for anyone missing or misplaced on this timeline. If you are missed or misplaced, please let me know by email and I'll adjust it. We all know that the first case of HIV in North America was in 1981. And from my interviews, I learned that the first case of HIV in Canada was in 1983. And in 1981, Kate Hankins was the Deputy Medical Officer of Health in, in Calgary, and Bluma Brenner was starting to do HIV research with Mark Weinberg. They are the OGs. Also a part of the OG group uh, what are Mary Fanning, Anita Rackless, and Sharon Walmsley, who started caring for dozens of, 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 of patients, most of course men uh, in, uh, with HIV in 1983. In 1985, social and ep epidemiology scientists, most notably Liviana Calcivera and Peggy Melson and others, started doing groundbreaking research. And then you can see what happened. 
the number of women HIV researchers kept growing and growing. And I asked myself, why are there so many women HIV researchers per capita for a field in research, other than maybe women's health, there are a, a significant number of women who do HIV uh, research. Uh, when I asked this question, a lot of people said, oh, it's because women are, are more caring. What I learned from the interviews was in the, in the 80s and 90s, actually, a lot of women went into the field because of homophobia and others weren't going into the field. So women are doing HIV research and, uh, um, because they're social justice warriors. And I thank these original women HIV researchers. You paved the way for so many of us. And now you won't believe this, how many women HIV researchers there are in Canada. Look at this slide. My team helped me to find the names of women who are doing HIV research in Canada today. Community researchers, academic researchers, postgraduate fellows, students, and more. If you identify as a woman HIV researcher and you don't find your name on this list, again, email me and, and, and I'll add it. This list is probably not complete and it would likely be double this. Hundreds and hundreds of women HIV researchers. Isn't that incredible? But what I learned from my interviews is that it has not been easy for many of these women, particularly the original women, but even also for more recent women um, HIV researchers, particularly racialized women researchers. We heard of the difficulties Maureen uh, went through um, as a Black woman researcher. Um, it has definitely been rewarding, amazing, and fun, and worth it. Everyone said that in the interviews, but for many, it has been hard. And I'll show you why, and I'll give you uh, an example. Here is, I'm using CAR as an example for H, as an HIV uh, research organization in Canada, not, not, not to, to uh, call out uh, uh, CAR, or, or, um, but just to use it as an example and to ask all of us to look at our organizations and to look at the structures and leadership in our organizations. As you can see, despite hundreds of women HIV researchers, there's been a gender gap in leadership positions. CAR was founded in 1991. There's been 16 presidents to date, and of those, three have been women. That's 19%. Next year, Dr. Marissa Brecker from Winnipeg will be president. Congratulations, Marissa. Okay, look at the Mark Weinberg lecture. I have the I, I give the Mark Weinberg lecture as an example, and I'd like us to all think about our keynote lecture. First, Mark Weinberg lectures, and out of twenty speakers, I am the seventh woman. Better odds, seven to thirteen or thirty-five percent. However, I believe that I am the seventh cis woman, first non-white woman maybe first non-white speaker, depending on how uh, Julio Montana identifies his race. While I don't identify as white, have a look at me, I sure do pass as white. I, and what I do identify as is as a Middle Eastern um, and Arab woman. I also identify as a straight cisgender uh, uh, settler woman, and I notice the lack of LGBTQ speakers in the Mark Weinberg lecture. Uh, this is also an uh, issue internationally. I looked at several uh, organizations across the world, but due to brevity, um, I've only picked uh, the International AIDS Society, which was founded in 1988. There's been 16 presidents, 12 men, and four women. I do think that we need to call it what it is. It's patriarchy. For those of you who don't know the definition of patriarchy, patriarchy is, tr is traditionally defined as a society in which the power is held by men. Patriarchy is structural sexism. Similarly, even more so than sexism, there is obvious racial discrimination in research, as well as homophobia and transphobia. I know that it is not always done intentionally. 
since as bell hooks teaches we are all programmed to uphold patriarchy we have all been programmed to see patriarchy as normal even when i was car conference co-chair i chose a white cis straight man as the mark weinberg lecturer we are all to blame as again we have been programmed for patriarchy as all of us have had our eyes opened over the last five years i have also and i want to ask you along with me that we continue to open our eyes wider and wider as my objective three outlines i don't want to call out these issues with shaming which i have done in the past and i apologize for that i want to call you in to work together as doris peltier and our uh, conference elder uh, just said to work together in a circle to make change for more equity in our world and in this context the world of hiv research and hiv in canada and we have made strides look at the list of keynote speakers at car this year three women one black scholar and a gay male colleague of mine I commend the organizing committee, but we are not done. We have to keep going year after year, examining the leadership and the speakers and the structures of our organizations. We need to strive and we need to demand equity. Okay, on to objective two, women and HIV. That is my area. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about women and HIV. While preparing this talk, I realized that I rarely give a talk anymore on women and HIV without honoring the principle of the meaningful engagement of women living with HIV and AIDS, and have come to realize how important hearing from people living with HIV in our work is. And therefore, I'd like to welcome Brecklin Bertozzi to join me to present this section. Brecklin, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Becklin Batozzi. I'm a community researcher in Hamilton, Ontario. I started as a peer researcher in 2012, and now I'm a peer engagement coordinator for the Heads Up 2 study with the University of Victoria, BC. I'm a woman living with HIV and a mother, and I have a lot of passion for community-based research. Thanks so much, uh, Brecklin, uh, for joining me. You know how much it means to me. Before Brecklin reviews our work from the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, I'm going to review some of the epidemiology of women and HIV. Here is the global epidemiology. Most of you probably know, as of 2020, there were 36 million adults living with HIV around the world. And of those, 53.6% were women. We don't have the time to review in detail, but I'm sure you can imagine um, that, uh, that because of social, political, and biologic reasons, this is known as the feminization of HIV. Here is the epidemiology of HIV uh, for Canada. As of 2020, there were approximately 70,000 people living with HIV in Canada. In that year, there were 1,639 new cases of HIV, a 21% decrease from 2019, assumed to be due to the decreased testing because of the COVID pandemic. Of new diagnoses, 28.6% were listed as female. These reports still report sex rather than gender. Um, I asked my team and they helped me to compile the percentage of new HIV cases that were women over the past decade in Canada from 2011 onwards. Um, and, and in 2011, the percentage of new cases that were women was 23.8%. And then in 2019, 30.2% and 2020, 28.6%. Uh, I can't verify it, but like Maureen spoke about, um, I think there is a worrisome increasing trend of, uh, of, a new, of new cases of HIV in women, or at least the proportion being women. And of the new uh, female cases in 2020, 
42.1% were Black women and 40% Indigenous women, as uh, compared to their male counterparts, where 38.5% were white. As mentioned in, uh, in my introduction, I do clinics in uh, northern Saskatchewan. Um, it's not, I, do the, I go there uh, because it's beautiful, uh, but also uh, uh, for this reason. In Saskatchewan, there are about 170 to 200 new cases of HIV per year, an incident rate of 15.7 per 100,000 in 2020, nearly four times the national average of 4.3 per 100,000. What I'm concerned about is the feminization of HIV in the province of Saskatchewan and might be occurring in other prairie provinces. This is probably, this is mirroring what's happening globally with increasing percentages of new cases being in women. As you can see, 47% of the new cases in 2019 were women and in 2020, 55% of the new HIV cases were women. This is a great concern, and I believe that we all across the country have to be allies to take action. I'll pass it on to Brecklin now to present some of our work of what we're doing and what we're trying to do to address this. Thanks, Mona. So in 2010, we set out to help answer questions for women living with HIV across Canada about their experiences, health outcomes, and what care they were getting and wanted with our study, the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, or CHIWOS for short. CHIWOS has been grounded in principles of critical feminism, anti-oppression, social justice, the greater involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS, and the meaningful engagement of women living with HIV and AIDS. CHIWOS uses community-based research involving women living with HIV as core partners throughout all stages of the research. I was a CHIWOS Peer Research Associate, or PRA for short, which I now call Community Research Consultant. As PRAs, we enrolled and conducted three surveys 18 months apart with 1,422 women living with HIV in BC, Ontario, and Quebec. Here are the demographics of the women who participated in CHIWOS. Their median age was 43, 96% identified as cisgender, and 4% as trans or gender diverse, 22% identified as Indigenous, 41% as white, and 30% as Afro-Caribbean Black, and 7% of other ethnicities. While 84% had a high school education or higher, 64% were living on an income of less than $20,000 per year, 64% reported being food insecure, and 11% housing insecure. Of the 1,312 women who answered the questions on violence at the baseline visit, 80% reported experiencing a form of violence in adulthood. I'll say that again, 80% a very high number which is prompting many women HIV researchers to be working on trauma-informed and trauma-aware care models. Here is an elegant longitudinal analysis that Dr. Carmen Logie led with the CHIWOS data, which found that at time point two, 25% of the women reported violence in the prior three months, so meaning current violence in their lives. And recent violence was associated with the intersecting stigmas of HIV-related stigma, racial discrimination, and gender discrimination, real evidence of the impact of intersectional stigma, and all contributed to increased depression. At the baseline visit using the CESD, 48.6% of women indicated they had depressive symptoms, another crucial topic to women living with HIV. Another very important issue for li women living with HIV is HIV-related stigma. With women reporting a median st 
stigma score of 62.5 out of 100 with high scores of personalized stigma, disclosure stigma, and issues with public attitude. HIV-related stigma, stigma being an issue rarely dealt with clinically. Two other analyses led by Dr. Logie showed the importance of HIV-related stigma and other intersecting stigmas on not only physical and mental quality of life, but also the cascade of HIV care. Stigma is important for clinical outcomes. We need to pay attention. Chivos, with the leadership of Yasmin Persad and Ashley Lacombe Duncan, has concentrated on quite a bit of work with trans women living with HIV. And I'm excited to present the results, as I believe there are many misconceptions about trans women and HIV in Canada. While other countries report a high prevalence of HIV among trans women, in Canada, it is not as high. It is likely closer to 2 to 3% that uh, being that only two to 3% of trans women in Canada are living with HIV. And look at this, trans women who participated in CHIWOS also had excellent cascade of HIV care numbers with 92% being in care and on antiretroviral therapy. And over half were accessing medical gender affirming therapy. As a team, we took the five CHIWOS peer reviewed papers involving trans women with HIV and the 54 other peer-reviewed uh, CHIVOS papers and use concept mapping to depict the health experiences of trans women living with HIV in a single diagram and a similar diagram, which, which looks just like this uh, for all women living with HIV. Gifted to us by elder Valerie Nicholson, it was set out to be and called honoring the voices of the women who participated in CHIVOS. And, and, uh, and the image is uh, called the Wheel of Resilience and Support. Also over the past decade, the Chiwos team with many colleagues developed a model of care, the woman-centered HIV care model, to address some of the issues that women in Chiwo shared with us. And here it is. The model is in the shape of a house to represent safety and stability. Trauma and violence aware care is the foundation. Person centered care with attention to social determinants of health and family make up the first floor. The second floor contains three rooms and represents integrated care, HIV integrated with women's health care, including sexual and reproductive health and rights and mental health and addiction care. Peer support, leadership, and capacity building are integral to women-centered HIV care and make up the roof. A woman is present larger than the house as she is the most important part and may be supported by peers to enter the house. The model is meant to be provided to all women in all their diversity and for all different ages. Isn't it great? Thanks, Brecklin. Yes, I think it's great. Um, okay, I think I have a good, um, uh, let me see, 10, 15 minutes left um, of our talk. Um, so where, where are we gonna go from here? Um, uh, well, I want you to think about a question. Um, what, uh, what do you think women HIV researchers and women living with HIV have in common? So I presented on both. What do you think they have in common? Well, I'm gonna tell you what I think they have in common. To me, the commonality is gender-based violence. It is violence against women. I know some of you may see it right away and others, you are likely saying, no way, uh, women HIV uh, researchers don't experience gender-based violence, but you'll think about it and you'll realize it's true. It is, and there is persistent and pervasive violence against women in our society at multiple structural and micro levels. In my view, and I admit this is my view, the violence is so pervasive and systemic for women researchers that they actually accept it as normal. I really haven't felt sexism, several said in their interviews, when the patriarchy is obvious when you look at the statistics. For women living with HIV, the violence and trauma is more blatant. Uh, and obvious. 
As Bell Hooks wrote, the fear of women being alone or unloved has caused women of all races to passively accept sexism and sexist oppression. For those of you who haven't studied violence and trauma, here is a brief tutorial in this diagram. Violence is the abusive act that happens to you or to someone from the outside. That act can be physical, sexual, mental, verbal. It's the violence and abuse that happens to you from the outside, like a microaggression uh, that could happen with someone that says that is abuse and violence. And the trauma is what you do or what someone does to themselves on the inside based on that violence, like saying, I'm, I'm not I'm not worth anything. Uh, I'm not important. I don't deserve it. I'm an imposter. That is all trauma that you're doing to yourself on the inside. And by the way, none of that is true. What I'm proposing is that we aim to apply trauma-informed practice to research, trauma-informed research. Trauma-informed practice is understanding the pervasive nature of violence and trauma and promotes environments of healing and recovery. I propose we all practice trauma-informed research. We are at a research conference after all. Not only should we practice trauma-informed research with our study participants and patients, but also with our staff, students, colleagues, and ourselves. What I'm proposing for us all is to be allies to fight for equity, social justice, and for a supportive, caring environment for everyone to actualize their true nature and potential. And so I'm asking you to be allies in this. And what does it mean to be an ally? It means recognizing one's own privilege and sometimes using that privilege to demand equity. It means recognizing the oppression and inequities experienced by groups unlike you and to see these inequities as unjust. It means to sympathize, to listen and learn about the experiences of those who experience oppression and, uh, not, uh, and to not dismiss them and to do so with humility. It means to take action for social justice, to speak up, lift up, mentor, sponsor, and take action against oppression and inequities. And in our field and what I have learned, uh, you're invited and accepted to be an ally. Um, and I, uh, I thank my many uh, Indigenous and Black uh, colleagues who've accepted me um, as an ally. Um, even if you're not accepted yet to be an ally, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, still strive uh, 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 to carry out all of these actions. Okay, well, what should we do as allies? What do women living with HIV need from us as allies? Maureen already mentioned it, and I'm going to mention it again, because we as the researchers, as the clinicians and the funders, we are the gatekeepers. Those in the field of women and HIV have heard it over and over again. Women living with HIV are asking for women only spaces. They need funding for the reopening and opening of women only aid service organizations. So I plead with the funders, can you please just give them the funding? Otherwise, we are perpetuating the structural sexism and the rates of HIV in women will continue to rise. Women living with HIV need women only spaces to gather with other women to bond and heal. They need peer supported and gendered HIV care. What do you think? Do you agree, Brecklin? Yes, absolutely. What about women HIV researchers? What do they need from us as allies? They need us to talk about the issues, talk about the issues, for example, that I'm bringing up today. They need us to invite, encourage, and demand diversity at the table. They need us to mentor and sponsor gender and racially diverse investigators and speakers. They need us to involve the community at all stages of research, and they need us to practice trauma-informed research. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, and uh, some of you may have noticed 
I uh, slightly changed my title. Um, and uh, in, my in my new title, I've asked uh, for a call for a reckoning. That is quite a lofty uh, a request and a big word. Uh, but it's really, I can't, I can't, it's, it's really not a reckoning, but it's a continued reckoning. Um, I'm not asking anything new, uh, even in this talk. This is not new information, just maybe presented in a new way. In 2017, we saw the gender inequities and horrors exposed by the Me Too movement. In 2020, the whole world finally saw the anti-Black racism and violence exerted by the police in the murder of George Floyd. And we all know about the many social justice and civil rights activist movements that have made such uh, strides before that. However, we cannot just accept the progress that we've made in the last few years as enough. We must continue to push for full justice and freedom for all to reach their full potential. And we can get there with trauma-informed practice and being allies all together. So please accept my calling. Thank you very much. At Chiwos, we dedicate our presentations to and honor the 73 women who participated in the study who died while we were running the study and likely the many more who died since. I cry every time I think of you and your families. Also, I'd like to acknowledge all the women living with HIV who participated in and, and have contributed to my research. I thank this long list of collaborators and partners, and I thank my funders, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the CTN. And thank you to Vijaya, Manakshi, Priscilla, Jill, Ashley, and Yaz, who helped me with my slides. And of course, I thank Brecklin uh, for presenting with me. It has been a highlight of my career to work so closely with you over the past decade, um, along with the many other community research co consultants that we've worked with. And Brecklin and I um, would be happy to accept um, questions. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful, interesting, thought-provoking talk. Um, there's opportunities to leave questions in the chat. There is one, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that they, this will populate as, <laughs> as we um, take this first question. Um, so thank you again, um, Brecklin and Mona. That was really fantastic. Um, the question that's in the chat, I don't know if, if you see it, but I, I can read it. It said, uh, is it possible that some of the increased feminization that we are seeing in HIV infection could also be due to a reduction in the amount of infection in gay, uh, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men? Yes. So um, there's been a big movement across Canada uh, to increase access for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which is essential. So um, uh, distributing and making a PrEP as accessible as possible uh, to those at risk um, is very, very important. And, uh, and I'd like to see the numbers of, uh, and the new cases of HIV and gay bisexual men who have sex with men go down even lower um, um, and, and ho however, the same strides have not been done uh, for women um, uh, living with HIV or people uh, who use and inject drugs. Um, and so I'd like to see the same uh, movements and, um, and uh, uh, degree of work for those populations. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I have a question. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, there's a question. I'll save mine. This question is for Brecklin. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Please put your questions in the chat. We have lots of time. Brecklin, did your experience with Chivos encourage you to keep working in research? That's the slightly hard question to say no to, considering Mona is here. But <laughs> maybe you could talk about what your experience was like and what you liked about it. That's, you know, um, or and maybe challenges too. Yeah, so the answer to the question is yes. Um, I think, you know, throughout my time with Chiwos, um, there's lot, been a lot of knowledge for me and growth. And um, 
I think that it's definitely encouraged me to stay involved and become um, an advocate and a support for women living with HIV. And it's it's very meaningful work for me. Um, so I feel like it has enriched my life in so many ways. And and it's it's really beautiful all of the connections that I've made and. And even the fact that I'm here today presenting this prestigious lecture with Mona is just uh, absolutely a dream. And, and um, I'm just really honored to be a part of this work. Oh, that's, that's so, what a lovely response. Thank you, Brecklin. Uh, we have quite a few more questions now, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, I think this one is from, I won't, I won't read it who it's from, um, Mona. What do you see as the biggest factor that's increased our representation of women HIV researchers in Canada to date? I actually think this is from Jason Brophy, um, Jason B. I might be wrong. Uh, what do you see as first steps to increase representation of BIPOC women? So that's two questions. What is the biggest factor that's in increased representation of women HIV researchers in Canada? And what do we need to do next, I think, to increase um, representation of BIPOC women? Okay, at first I, I thought I read the question Jay said and I thought it was for women about women living with HIV, but it's about women HIV researchers. Um, I what the what um, what women HIV researchers uh, said in the interviews um, over and over again is that um, is that it it had a lot to do with mentorship. So the women from one generation mentored uh, women in the next generation to become HIV researchers. So it's a lot of women mentoring women, mentoring more women, um, you know, which which creates, I think, a very um, uh, unique and uh, supportive um, environment. I think also um, a lot of uh, women, um, uh, you know, are, are, do tend to lean towards uh, the the social justice um, um, angle and uh, lens in terms of wanting to make a difference in in uh, research, um, and which would be another reason uh, to go into the field uh, of HIV. But I, I do want to mention how important um, that the mentorship piece uh, ha um, has been um, uh, was reviewed, and probably the biggest um, feedback to a junior HIV researcher was to look for great mentors. Um, and how do we get more um, BIPOC women HIV researchers? Well, first of all, we have to support them so we don't lose them. Um, uh, look how stressed uh, Maureen looked, and I heard it in the interviews. Um, Black women uh, HIV scholars um, are not being supported. We have to support them. Uh, we have to make them feel safe and comfortable. Um, and then uh, support more uh, graduate students, postdoctoral students, uh, more uh, Black women going into medical school uh, and, and undergrad uh, right from high school. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to shake it up and um, ask one maybe uh, that both of you could answer, which is uh, looking at the crisis in Saskatchewan, how, and I'm just reading it as it's written, how do we best support our PAWS sisters there? What can we do nationally? Um, well, I think we have to talk about it. Um, I um, Politically, we have to put pressure. It's not acceptable, the rates of HIV in Saskatchewan. And, um, and um, I, you know, the front line there, I work with the front line staff. They are working so hard. Um, but funding is not being directed towards HIV in the province, um, and it should be. Uh, it, it's really, I don't think it's that hard what needs to be done there. Um, uh, a program like what's been done with Stop HIV um, in uh, British Columbia um, can be easily rolled out, um, but uh, it takes funding uh, and it takes political will. So we need to put uh, pressure on, uh, on the politicians, on the funders, and, to, and say we'll work with them. Um, uh, to make it possible. Uh, I think uh, women in uh, Saskatchewan n do need women only spaces um, and need women um, outreach support. Um, imagine if there was a, um, a uh, woman only space that was supporting women and, and um, was cushioned in the, in the, in, um, as a women's health um, uh, uh, clinic and, um, and women could bring their children I saw a question about uh, combining women and, and children care. 
I think that that's important, at least allow women to bring their children. And uh, yes, if, if the clinic could provide care, but not only to the children who uh, are living with HIV, but but all, all their children. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, outreach, uh, funding, um, a program uh, like Stop HIV, um, you know, I think we could make a difference in Saskatchewan. Great. And, and Brecklin, do you have any also perspectives to add on how there could be some national support among uh, women living with HIV for, for women in Saskatchewan? That was a part of the question too. Uh, yeah, I think Mona answered this question really well. I, if I can just add, like, I guess I'm always like advocating for peer support, right? So just peer support. And I think also not on a national level, it's it's been especially helpful in, in my experience to connect virtually, right? Because you can you, you can reach um, people in, in different places throughout Canada um, without having to travel and, and, and such. So I, I think that's been a little bit helpful in connecting us all together a little bit. That's, that's wonderful. And um, there's another uh, uh, a question here around, you know, it says, do you provide training on trauma informed practices and maybe trauma informed research? And if, if you're not specifically providing training, maybe you could share some key principles and where where um, the listeners and watchers could learn more. Yeah, so in preparing this talk, I, I, I um, looked for materials on training for uh, trauma informed practice and research. And I think you're right, there is a lack of availability on training um, on trauma informed care, a trauma informed practice and research. So maybe that's something CAR can do, um, or the or the CTN to develop a training um, a training program. Um, so, uh, Canadian experts in the field um, include um, uh, Dr. Nora Pick um, in Vancouver, Dr. Jesseline Rana uh, in Toronto, uh, Jay McGilvery, who's a um, midwife. Um, as well as Elder Valerie Nicholson. Um, and uh, actually Brecklin also is working on a, um, a trauma aware, um, tra uh, trauma and violence aware uh, care model. But I do think it's something uh, that we need to do. Um, we do have um, some training in the Women's Centered HIV Care uh, Toolkit. We have a toolkit that you can uh, find online for free uh, at just put in Women's Centered HIV Care. A toolkit and really um, trauma informed practice comes down uh, to being one thing just being nice, uh, listening, uh, being open, saying I believe you, um, and, um, and, and building an environment of trust um, and safety. So those are the basic principles, but I, I think actually it's something uh, that we should do.